great show. Are we ever going to come to Spain, basically? You know, we are talking about it next year. We're talking about trying to expand into... We're talking about trying to expand the company into Europe next year. <laughs> so that's the, the goal of the company is to expand into Europe and really just, uh, you know, really push through the damage of Brexit. So, yeah. Where's Sabrina Lee? Sabrina? Where's Sabrina, Sabrina the teenage witch? <laughs> oh, very sure. She's either shy or she's not here. But she did ask, how was it performing? How was it performing at the same event as your idol, Annie Lennox, when you did the Pavarotti and Friends in 2000? Were you able to talk to her? And were you starstruck? Yes, I've, um, listen, I've managed to speak to Annie many times now. Um, Annie Lennox, George Michael, Pavarotti, and Aqua. All at the same event. <laughs> Any incredible, um, I speak to, well, I spoke to both of them about their voices, which was a relief to know that all singers are completely paranoid about losing their voice, including Annie Lennox, which was great. George Michael was actually the, 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 the person who I was most nervous to meet. He's one of the vocalists who taught me how to sing, listening to him as a child. You're nice. Oh, that's so nice. And, uh, well, it's funny because about, you know, opposite genders, I really was taught to sing by listening to Diana Ross or Smokey Robinson, who the false side. But going back to George, um, I had just done a cover of Last Christmas and I was really nervous to meet him. And he brought it up and he said, you did a cover of my song. And I was just absolutely nervous and said, it was, it was really well done, and I just melted. And I think that day they invented the melted face emoji. <laughs> really lovely. And they got singing lessons from Pavarotti on that same, that same trip. That sounds incredible. Mm. Where's Tara Smith? Where's Tara? Hi. Tara wants to know how you cope from being away from home, and do you bring any home comforts with you on tour? I have illegally bought my dog. Um, no, of course. Oh, I really? Oh, shit, you know, I forgot to leave food out in the water for the dog. Because I'm like a cat, is it? To be living in Guildford. Do you know what? It's not my fault. I deserve this tour. I don't blame myself. You know, it's been so long. I think I've become used to this. One of the positive things I'll say about my shit bag, dirt bag, crap father was that growing up in a household where uh, my father was a, a sailor, he used to go away for long periods of time. And something about that was sort of instilled in me. He had this road mentality, you might relate to this, where you get a little antsy after a while, 25, 30 years of traveling. I think Richard and I are very used to those periods of me being away. So we had 11 years of me being stuck home going, he was kind of like, this is you full time. <laughs> so I think we're both enjoying that. It's been really good. That's great. Where's Marek? Marek Sabolski. Yeah. There's Marek. Hi, darling. Hi, Hi. Hi. I love your time. How do you come up with those incredible mashups of songs during your live performances? Is it something that comes naturally during rehearsals or are you properly planned? I've always heard them before yeah. mashups were a thing. Um, Right from a little kid, I used to sing other songs over different songs and um, could always hear something that really annoys me in pop music today, which is this sort of litigious thing where people sue each other. I subscribe to the Andy Warhol theory of art, which is that all art is borrowed. There's nothing new under the sun anymore. If you look at a scale on a keyboard, there are a finite amount of notes in the scale. And so, what we're really doing is we're sort of reimagining, and I think when we write a song, something happens, maybe this is true for all creators, where you start thinking, it's like a broken dream, you're remembering a dream, and when you first wake up from a dream, the dream is instantly decaying. Fragments of the dream are disappearing. You're desperately trying to remember it. By the time you tell your friend, worst story you've ever told anyone. Who ever wants to hear that? Oh my god, I had the most amazing dream last night. <laughs> Great, can't wait to hear about it. 
songs are the same thing. So I think that there are always little elements of different songs anyway. I'm not saying that my mashups are indications of those, but what happens is they reinvigorate my um, interest in the song. I try not to do it to very classic songs. I would never do it to, to the moon back. I would never do it to um, uh, you know, Truly Made Me Deeply or something like that. But where it's a song that maybe perhaps, uh, I, it may not have made this set list, but I think I kind of want to do something. I'll hear 10 other ideas in there. And uh, on this tour, I just handed them over to Trevor. I did versions of them and then handed them to Trevor, and then he's an amazing mastering engineer, so he would then just make them sound fat. Really, really cool. Yeah, here in my head. Great, where's Dasha Banks? Dan, Dasha wants to know what your top three favorite perfumes are. I think they go with aftershaves as well. But there's a secret. Ah, uh, yeah, you yeah, think I know what you're trying to work out, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> I only wear one thing that you can commercially buy, and then everything else is really hard to find, and it's taken me years to do that, and you know why, right? I believe in magic. So I believe in creating an experience when you meet someone that lingers, and I think that scent is one of the most uh, simple ways we can do that. So I, lo I love that. I like that sometimes when people are in the front row, they may have a memory of me that's olfactory. And I don't mean an old factory. <laughs> uh, and because that's, that were my first memories of going to concerts. My first time I saw Stevie Nicks in concert, I was close enough that I could smell her perfume. Second time I saw Michael Jackson in concert, same thing. Uh, and I was smart enough to hire his assistant. So my assistant for the longest time used to work for Michael Jackson. I found out what his perfume was. Turns out that your pH level drastically affects how perfume smells on you. So even if I told you what I wore, it wouldn't smell the same on you. I know this because Michael Jackson's perfume on me smells like a toy. <laughs> Where's Joanna Sharp? Joanna's back there. And she's wondering if there are any lyrics that you liked when you wrote them and now make you cringe. <laughs> yes, I met someone recently who was very charming, very sexy, huge fan, and then told me some of the songs that I've written that are really fucking cringe. <laughs> and I agreed. I actually agreed with him. But you don't think that they cringe at the time. Just like I don't think that, you know, when I made the music video with the, um, you know, Barbara Bush hairstyle, that that was cringe, now I will never have it. I think we all have those moments in our life with fashion, with songs, with lyrics, and whatever. There's things I, there's only one lyric I would change, there's two I would change. I'm going to admit it to you for the first time ever. Into the Moon and Back, there is a grammatical error. Do you know what it is? Great. Ash, what is it? Is it called treason? Yes, she's been trialed for treason. So ever since the song was released, the minute that it was live, I, I, I realised my mistake once it was recorded, and then I've always sung, she's been tried for treason. But on the day, I sang trialled. And even though I knew that that was incorrect, it was just, that's how it sang. That's the comp that they use. A comp is like you, you do a take of a song and then they use that particular slip to be by, ended up on the record, became the number one single. I had to listen to it for years going, <laughs> so I thought I'll just never remember a minute. The other lyric I would change is in affirmation. Um, I do not believe that when a bliss negates the need to be undressed. I think we all need to be very naked <laughs> um, in marriage. I don't know what the I was trying to say that love is deeper than sex, but no, I think that they're very connected. Yeah. Where's Richard and Juliet? Oh, there they are. Hi. Hi. Best dressed. <laughs> Can you get the award, please? Oh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we didn't bring it to It's a meat tray. <laughs> vegan meat tray. It's a vegan tray. <laughs> it's a carrot. <laughs> it, it's a carrot. <laughs> Ten oh. carrot diamond. Yes. But today we just didn't bring it. 
What was the last gig that you went to see? Oh, the last gig I went to see. Wow. Well, this is your gig, was it? So, do you remember it? Say it, yelling out loud. It was Madamax. Madamax, before COVID. Until all of you, I have been extremely cautious about COVID. I have never been in a public space without a mask until this tour. Never been to a restaurant, never been to a theatre without a mask. But when I say never been to a restaurant, I mean never been to a restaurant. I would only ever go to a terrace outside, which you can do in, uh, in Los Angeles. So I've never been to concerts or anything like that. So my experience has been very sheltered. So Madame X happened and I witnessed Madonna get COVID on stage and thought, wow, she looks fatigued, she looks tired. I can see the lung capacity was reduced, all of that stuff. And um, that was it, that was the last tour that I saw. I saw it four times because I am a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, there's Judy Fox. There's Judy. Oh, it's Julie, I'm sorry. Yeah. Where's Julie over there? There's Julie over there. Hi. Yeah. This is your version of holding on the unit up high. <laughs> Have you ever written a song inspired by the love you have for your dog Huxley or previous dogs you've had? <laughs> That's such a beautiful question, and I always think about that. Um, today is the no crying QA. I've been crying in a lot of QAs because I've been very emotional. Uh, and I'm not going to cry my tears. If I did, it would be about uh, Wally, who was my dog, who was 16 when he passed away. And uh, yeah, he was extraordinary. So he's the closest I've ever had to a child. And Huxley is now three. I have to do that. <laughs> uh, he is just the total opposite. So my experience of pets. Just because um, how do you write a song about wanting to fuck a dog? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, moving swiftly. <laughs> um, where's Martin and Sharon? There's Martin and Sharon back there. The first dance at their wedding was I Know I Loved You. What inspired that song? Anger at Sony Music. We wrote the entire uh, Affirmation album, delivered it. That song didn't exist. It had The Lover After Me, Crash and Burn, Affirmation, Two Beds in the Coffee Machine, I Don't Know You Anymore. Every song on the album that you know. So, um, he said, Yeah, it's okay. There's no truly madly deeply on there. Probably not going to sell. <laughs> we were like, does that truly matter deeply? Are you, are you, are you want to truly matter deeply? Is that, is that what you want? Are you want to truly matter deeply? Okay, give, give me 15 minutes, bitches. <laughs> so we went back to the piano room in Walter from our fifth studio. Daniel came up with, I'm going to be kind, the more complicated chords he was capable of. <laughs> and they were beautiful. They were, however, played by Walter Afanasiev on the album, as everything on the album was played by Walter. I came up with that song in 15 minutes, and I had a lump in my throat when I sang it. Didn't know why, because I wasn't in love. I was going to get romance. I was going through a divorce. I was the lover after me. I was, I don't know you anymore. I was, love doesn't exist. I was, don't want to be gay. I was like, why am I attracted to men when men have only ever hurt me and my father is a monster? And how is this ever going to work? Years later, at a New Year's Eve gig, I remember singing I Know I Loved You, and I realized I met the person that I wrote that about. I married Richard. And I, you know, that was a 17-year marriage. So sometimes you write songs about the future. 
you know, and if you listen to the lyrics, you know, that song's all about a future love. So um, we delivered it within 15 minutes on a fax. So we sent them <laughs> uh, via electronic something overnight fax, and a fax, and it said, here's your number one, you fuckers, or something like that. <laughs> number one single around the world. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to be told no. So. Okay, there's Laura Collinson. There's Laura. Hi. Now, Laura is an early years teacher, and she was wondering if you'd ever consider teaching again, as it seems to be one of your passions. I wouldn't have the energy that you have, and I admire you so much, and I think that uh, teachers should be paid as much as solicitors. <laughs> For real. I think that um, our investment in education is grossly underfunded. I loved teaching, but I feel like I do that now. And um, there's so many children in my life that I get to practice those skills. Uh, I really, really love it. I love education and I admire you for it. I live in a country now where I think the solution to uh, stopping children getting murdered with AR-15 rifles is to give you a gun so that you could just shoot your sailor as he walks in the room. Our concept in the Western world about uh, nurses and teachers is to me so um, upside down. doesn't make sense to me. We should be paying nurses and teachers an extraordinary amount of money, and we don't, so I applaud you for what you did. Yeah. That is all the time we've got for, uh, for our questions. Uh, don't ask me, I put a little bit Oh, I really look good. I mean, you look fabulous today. No, I've it's <laughs> probably the best you've looked at any one of your VIP <laughs> Q&As or tour. I'm ready for it. Let's get yeah. some pictures taken. So let's just get, get, get you all lined up and get some pictures done. Jane and Ruby. We'll